Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our panel on regulating fintech for a better future. I'm Joanne Barefoot. I'm CEO and co-founder of the Alliance for Innovative Regulation, or AIR, and we have a wonderful panel for you today. We have Richard Tang, the CEO of the Financial Services Regulatory Authority at ADGM. We have Diana Paradis, uh, the CEO of Suede. We have Michael Pirawar of the Milken Institute, and we have Anat Weta, chairwoman of the Israeli Securities Authority. I want to welcome my panel. I'm really looking forward to a fascinating conversation. Let me start, uh, Anat, by asking you, what do you think are the uh, technologies that regulators themselves are looking to utilize to speed up the supervisory process? We know it's hard for, I'm a former bank regulator myself, it's hard for regulators to keep pace with the pace of technology today. What are the technologies they're looking to? Okay, so hello everyone. And uh, thank you for uh, having me in this uh, wonderful panel. Uh, and I'm happy to take this uh, first question. So as technology is, is getting more inherent in the financial services market, we see that the supervisory challenges getting bigger and more complex. And as the data gets to be big data, we as regulator need to make a shift from manual supervision to supervision that is based on technology. So we here at the ISA, we're currently implementing, I can give some examples, and this is the uh, first one of them. We have a project that we call data science project that is uh, managed on trading data, for example, to figure out whether we're missing trading violations by using AI tools, such, such as unsupervised learning, machine, machine learning, and other uh, tools that uh, we used within. We're also testing currently some systems in our corporate finance department in order to tackle uh, alerts from non-financial and financial data like news, social media, et cetera. We use structured and unstructured data that can deliver quality alerts for our references to support the supervision purposes with a minimum of false positives. This will become easier once we implement in the future, in the near future, an IXBRL uh, reporting met method. We hope to start it in 2021, like other Western markets worldwide. But there are still serious challenges that we are coping with the Hebrew language that we still have to solve. We are also about to start a new reform in Israel by supervising financial information service providers. We called it the open banking reform. And that is the first time that the ISA will supervise a complete data driven field. And we're currently basing an appropriate supervisory a technological approach in order to execute this project in the near term. And I can also mention here the implementation that we have of advanced tools and platforms in the investment department in the ISA using block blockchain implementation in some uh, information system in the ISA internal system. So I can say that we widely targeting and challenging our supervisory processes to use technological tools in order to speed them up and to make them much more advanced and precise to adjust themselves in the changing market needs. Thank you. We have a short time for our panel, but does anyone want to add anything different uh, from what are not covered? from the standpoint of your own agency or entity? Yeah, maybe if I can just jump in on that front. Um, I do think that on, on our front, we are trying to use technology for, for to support greater market access as well as to manage risk. Right? So if you look at managing risk, the whole Wirecat episode demonstrate that today's method of trying to do things like cash validation is extremely archaic. So we are doing proof of concept on that front to make sure that we have real-time surveillance of account, cash accounts of clients help with financial institutions regulated by us. Um, and if there's any discrepancy, ourselves and the financial institutions will be alerted, right? So, so there's a risk dimension, but there's also a growth dimension. And we are experimenting with the US and Australia on cross-border offerings using tokens that are compliant in nature. 
So that that is how do you support all the both the growth and risk dimension and the usage of those technology. Thank you. As we go along, if others want to add in on that, uh, please do. But Diana, let me go to you for the next question. So regulators are basically trying to do two things. One is adopt new technology, reg, reg tech and supervisory technology for themselves, and then also foster an innovative ecosystem and also manage the risks that may be arising from new technology in the marketplace. So when you look at that uh, role of fostering uh, better technology, how do you see the uh, opportunities there and, and what kinds of partners are regulators looking for? The, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I guess from, from our perspective, you know, it's, it's three labs, we've obviously been quite privileged to be able to partner actually with a lot of regulators in, in the work we've been doing as a technology company. And so I think that we've witnessed in the past few years, uh, even relative to when we started, you know, like around five years ago, that regulators have become a lot more active to really foster that fintech ecosystem. So you went from a world where you would have some side conversations to actually, you know, hackathons, uh, you know, what we call tech sprints, so regulators being quite active in their interaction with, with, the, with tech companies, um, doing actually like accelerators, things that really help to, to have that interaction in, in a much more open way than, than what uh, they've been used to in the past. So I think that the you this, this uh, fintech ecosystem in a very uh, positive and dynamic way. And I think that what's going to really uh, make or break the difference, I guess, in terms of uh, which regulators start really being more and more proactive is how much do they incorporate that in their own side. So effectively hiring developers in their own side, hiring, um, you know, actually working, you know, with the, the tech companies rather than just experimenting with them. And so I think that the, you are seeing that th there is a reality in this partnerships, uh, you know, creating and what makes them successful um, in almost uh, you're getting to a much deeper understanding as to how different organizations fundamentally operate. So I think that the, the, the perfect fintech ecosystem in many ways, and that I really do think regulators can continue fostering and are definitely going in that direction, uh, comes from a world where partnerships and uh, you know, work from like, you know, small tech companies to large tech companies to consultants to, uh, you know, industry becomes very much concatenated thanks to the platform that the regulators offer. Um, and so, you know, the, the one of the, the conversations as well that's quite interesting is obviously how do you prioritize around all of this around, as a regulator? And I would say that what I would support and what I see to become more and more successful in this kind of relationship industry cross regulators has been very much in, in the, the more bullish you become incorporating that tech talent in house, uh, becoming much more tech savvy in house actually really empowers the regulators to have the right kind of conversations with tech companies to also change their own infrastructure for the industry. Um, and so it's uh, it's something that I do think is, is quite exciting to see. And I do think that the regulators that obviously do uh, the more in that space, the, the, the more pioneering they will be relative to the rest of the industry, of course. Let me ask any of you, uh, yeah, Mike, it looks like you wanna join in on that. I, I, a question I have in my mind, but you don't need to address this if you got a different thought is what are the barriers to that? What, what makes it difficult for regulators to be able to foster this kind of ecosystem? But yeah, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'll, I'm happy to talk about that. One of the things I was gonna mention was that, you know, in the United States, one of the things that's unique to us is we have a highly regular, highly fragmented regulatory system, right? So we, if, if, if somebody is involved in the FinTech world or anywhere in financial services, they may be dealing with multiple regulators. And so the difficulty we've often heard, I'm a former securities regulator myself, is who do I talk to? And then if they talk to one group and they might do a fun tech sprint, like you know the CF, the Commodity Future, or, I mean, the um, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau does, but they may also be regulated by a banking regulator. So um, some of the difficulty is coordination among the regulators. And then add to that, that even within agencies in the United States, um, there seems to be disparate, there's a lot of disparate um, data collection going on within the different divisions. Now, we've recently seen just last month, one of the regulators, uh, the Commodity Future Trading Commission in the United States actually set up a separate office for data um, because what they were, they were getting complaints that their market participants were reporting multiple forms of data just to different departments within that one agency. 
And um, even though the regulators had been, you know, uh, opening up offices of innovation um, and trying to talk to, to, the, to the market participants, the data collection was still disparate. So what I think you're gonna see in the United States is a consolidation of these efforts first within agencies and then across agencies. I think that to answer your question, Joanne, I think that's, that's the biggest difficulty or challenge in the US and the quicker we get there, the quicker uh, everyone's gonna be better off. Yeah, I can make... just add to that. I think Joanne, I think you raised an important point. I think because I work in the regulatory agencies, there are just two points I just wanted to add. One is the policy makers and the legislators need to make sure that the regulators have enough resources to support innovation. So it's in terms of human resources, financial resources, to make sure that you have the right talent within the organization if you wish to really support the agenda. And the second really is for regulators to have that experimentation spirit. Because when we first set up our regulatory sandbox, we didn't know where we would go, right? But because of that regulatory sandbox that we set up, which is now the second most active globally, we are able to get up close and personal with the innovators, with the entrepreneurs, and we try to understand what the business model are coming through. And from there, understand how to manage the risk. And we are able to come up with a tailored regulatory framework to support them in terms of their growth. Yeah, that's so well taken. I will mention my nonprofit organization, the Alliance for Innovative Regulation, has put out a paper that we call the RegTech Manifesto uh, to lay out what these challenges are for regulators to be able to um, why, why, and how to keep up. So, and it's a request for comments. We would love to have comments from anyone. Um, Mike, let me go back to you for a moment and then anyone join in on this as well. The, the dilemma for regulators is that they have to, they're trying to foster desirable innovation, but at the same time, protect the public from harm that could arise with it. What do you see as the key risks potentially to uh, the public and uh, as well as the key benefits and, and how do regulators get that balancing act right? Yeah, so, so Anat started out talking about, you know, there's so much big data coming into regulators right now. And so as a result, in order for regulators to fulfill their mandate for consumer protection or investor protection, they themselves and their regulated entities have to embrace things like you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and those types of things. Um, I can say, you know, my former agency, the Securities and Exchange Commission also uses Palantir, um, which is a software company that was designed for the intelligence agencies, but it's a way to bring in desperate data sources and look for connections among individuals engaged in violative behavior, such as insider trading uh, and those types of things. Um, you know, traditionally the, the, the regulators in the US just collected a bunch of this data you know, put it on servers and then they'd have people looking through it, you know, with, with databases and spreadsheets and all that sort of stuff. Increasingly, U.S. regulators are moving to the cloud. Um, you know, Diana, I think, mentioned, somebody mentioned um, real-time surveillance. Oh, it was Richard mentioned real-time surveillance, right? So in order to have real-time surveillance with literally millions of transactions in the stock market happening uh, on an hourly basis, you have to embrace cloud computing and, and things like, you know, artificial intelligence and, and machine learning. And then in terms of protecting the investors themselves, the US has a, um, a preference towards disclosure-based regulation or uh, investor education type uh, regulation, right? So the challenge there is that consumers, investors, you know, range in age from, you know, the teenagers all the way up to 80, 90 year olds, right? And, and we have a, 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 a disparate uh, population. Some are embracing technology and some are not. So in order to provide the proper disclosures for some people prefer it in a paper-based form and get their shareholder reports or quarterly reports in paper. And then you have the young people who never read paper and don't even go to websites and now have to, you know, want to use the, do, do things on their phone. So, so the challenge for the regulators is, you know, eventually we're going to get into where everybody's, you know, digitally native or born digital, Joanne, as you point out in your RegTech manifesto, but we haven't gotten there yet. So the challenge right now in the transition period is how do you balance the needs for um, providing the proper um, it, you know, education and the, and the proper disclosures for people in the places where they're going to actually read it. Yeah. Diana, and, yeah, go ahead. Yes, sorry, I was just going to chip in on that. Um, I guess that, the, you know, it's a very real thing that the balancing act between, you know, having a real protection of the consumer versus the dynamism of innovation and something that I would advocate 
uh, you know, aside a lot of the work people are doing on data standards and, and all of that, which I think is actually quite important, is almost that you want to have a, in that kind of, you know, public private sector relationship, almost a disproportionate amount of representation of the innovation of effectively the smaller companies that are just entering the market. Because what happens is that when you're a big tech company already, when you're a Palantir or a Google, the innovation in many ways has already happened. So it's too late to actually protect the consumer at that stage because things have already taken place. So the opportunity for regulators is almost to, to really get close. Uh, a bit what Richard was mentioning around like the experimentation piece, but to really get close in the trenches at the grassroots level with a vast variety of smaller companies and income, you know, like, uh, you know, nascent almost technologies, um, because that's the best way to protect the consumer. So that balanced in act for me in many ways is not just that, you know, at the stage of using the Googles and the Palantirs and those kind of guys, but it's almost more important to do it with the smaller tech companies as they, as they are experimenting with the newer technologies, because afterwards it's actually almost too late. Things have already happened in many ways. So it's, uh, uh, that's the, the the flex point from my perspective to really focus on. Yeah, this ability to have a safe place for experimentation just seems critical. You can't innovate unless you can try things out. And if you're a regulator, you've got to be careful about just trying things out if you don't know if it's going to work. And now let's get you back into this. What are you thinking either on this issue of how to get the balance right or in terms of what you think the priorities are going forward? If I can just jump in on that front, I, I, I do think that one of the biggest challenge facing both the financial industry as well as the regulatory agencies by and large is global coordination and sometimes within border coordination like Mike mentioned. Right? So if you look at, if we want to harness the full benefits of a lot of this innovation that's advancing at a very rapid pace, be it stable coins, be in the payment space, credit space, robot advisory space. A lot of times you require cross-border coordination and within borders coordination, within the agencies. If you take stable coins, for instance, in the States, you have so many different agencies. You can cut across banking, you can cut across payment, asset management, etc. How do you regulate that effectively in terms of managing the risk so that we can harness and benefit from the upside? Of the, I think is one of the important issues within countries you need to look at how, how to bring about greater coordination. You need a bespoke regime. Cross-border is even more challenging going forward and it's something that regulators need to work quite closely together so that there's a common typology and classification for this asset class and not only this asset class but many other things that's coming through going forward as well as what's the best way to manage them, to manage the risk while the investors, consumers, and others can enjoy the upside of it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And that, go ahead. Okay, so I will refer to, to this question of how, how do we look uh, ahead and the next uh, priority, our, our priorities for the next uh, decade. So 10 years is, is very long term. In, and I think that for us in those And let days, me tell you, we've been given the one minute warning, so you're going to get the last word on this. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay. So if, if, I, if I have to uh, define our, 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 our big challenge for the next 10 years, I think we can uh, uh, call it uh, open finance. As I mentioned before, we are here in Israel at the beginning of the open banking uh, reform, which is a huge reform in Israel, and will refer at uh, the first uh, step to mainly to deposits, credits, and financial advisory. But the next steps would be the open finance, the twins, and I'm sure that all of us uh, know it, how to enable the customer to see the and to control his holistic world of finance activity, like in a digital friendly supervised applications. And that will include in the future, as we see it, in addition to the um, above um, uh, areas such as uh, deposits, credit and financial advisory, also insurance, pension, saving, and even the day-to-day -day consumption activity of all retail customers that would be challenged by third party providers for many other services like cellular, leasing, food consumption, etc. And I 
the challenge that we see is to have here a very active cross-border regulatory sandbox. And our challenge is, despite our small size as a country, to trans transform Israel and to become a true better site for Israeli fintech companies and to expand global business opportunities to early stage relevant players, which Israel could be a great platform to raise them here and to help them to scale up to be grown companies. So I think both are our priorities for the next 10 years. That's a perfect note to end on. I want to thank all of you. Our time is up, but I've really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much.